Hey, Anshul. Hi, James. This is weird because we were talking off camera. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Anshul Vash. She is the founder of a nonprofit called Reach Out Together, which promotes uh, mental health awareness. And you co-authored a book. Man, you've come a long way since I first met you. She co-authored a book called Success Strategies. I got a copy right here. This is not mine because she signed it to the wrong person. But I got the copy right here. And truth be told, full disclosure, if it's not obvious already, we know each other. We used to work together many years ago. And when I came up with the idea for grappling with grief, the first person whose story I knew I wanted to tell was yours. Thanks, James. And I knew that because your story is unbelievable, it, especially for a girl, a, a relatively young girl. Yeah. I'm not going to ask how old you are, but a relatively mm -hmm. young girl. Your story is unbelievable, and I knew most of it before I did my research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why if, if basically the concept of, gra of grappling with grief is to tell stories of people who have dealt with tragedy and grief in their life and channeled it into positivity, okay. that's exactly what you are. And so uh, that's why I wanted to tell your story. So to start out, you were born in India. Yeah. I knew that. You grew up in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, why did you move to Nigeria? Tell me about that. What was the why was the decision made to move to Nigeria from India? Um, we were very young, and there are just more opportunities in Nigeria for, for my parents to financially grow, I guess, as compared to in India. Um, India, the population is so big, and there are just so many complications living there that my parents decided to move. Um, my father comes from a village in India, in north of India, Uttar Pradesh. It's a really small town. And at a very young age, he realized that's just not the life that he wants to live. He doesn't want to raise a family in a village. He wanted to step out. And he did at a very young age, at the age of, um, I don't know exactly how old he was, but he, <laughs> I know that he was in the ninth grade, um, really young. He ended up leaving. He studied commerce, moved from science. like. He basically changed his life. He's my hero till today, just knowing his story. And honestly, as a young girl, witnessing his progress was just remarkable. And when he got an opportunity to transfer to Nigeria, he took it instantly. Now, I got to ask you about Boko Haram, because you, uh, how, wh what time period were you in Nigeria? Were you, it was in the 2000s, right? Yeah. And so Boko Haram, were they of prominence while you were still living there? Maybe towards the end of it is when we all got to know more about the organization. Okay. Um, but we, like, I know now that they've been around for a very long time, you know, setting roots in the north of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, not where we were. We were okay. more uh, Lagos, which is West Africa, uh, West Nigeria. Um, but it didn't really impact us and our daily lifestyle. Okay. Obviously, Nigeria is not known to be a very safe place. So mm -hmm. you just take your precautions when you live there um, and you'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know because I, you know, anybody who's not familiar with Boko Haram, it's a militant group, Islamic yeah. group. Uh, they're against Western society and Western ideals and uh, killed tens of thousands of people. I think they tried to overthrow the government. And so when I was looking up, you know, the time period that you were there, I thought, man, I wonder if you were like smack dab in the middle of that. So it sounds like you got to kind of avoid it. Oh, absolutely. And we were always careful. We just took precautions. Right. And right. never went to areas where we know you shouldn't be at. Right. Right. Okay. Avoid trouble. Now, um, growing up, you had two brothers. Yeah. Your older brother, and I apologize if I mispronounce their names. That's okay. Older brother, Prashan. Yes. And your twin brother, Tushar. Yes. There you go. And the first... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The first family turmoil, I guess, if that's the right word, that you dealt with was your mom uh, came down with cancer. Yeah. How old were you? And tell me about that. Um, Tashar and I, my twin brother and I, we were um, seven years old at that time. Uh, and we had to move back to India for a little bit for the year and a half for my mom's surgery and recovery. Um, and why recovered. India? Why did you go back to India? Because... The medical facilities in Nigeria are just not good, okay. just truthfully not good enough. And it just made sense to bring her back. And we faced a lot of financial challenges during that time. When we moved back, my, my father lost his job. You know, we had to make sure that mom was OK. Mm. And uh, he moved back after a year while mom was still recovering. And, you know, eventually we moved back to Nigeria, which was home. But it was a definitely a very difficult transition because sure. 
you know, we're still really young as siblings, right? We were learning English and from learning English to moving to India, not knowing Hindi, mm -hmm. um, people were calling us uneducated because we couldn't speak in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved back to Nigeria after a year and a half, then we were in the middle of both, like we're speaking pidgin English and we're speaking bits of Hindi. So it was like mixed up. Um, so in terms of development, like as children, I guess we, we internally faced things that we never talked about um, because we witnessed our parents struggling, right? Mm -hmm. And as children, we just wanted to be there and support them and not make their lives harder. How's your mom today? She's good. The best good. she can be. Good, good, good. Yeah. Now, when you were 13, uh, something happened to Prashan, yeah. your older brother. Yeah. You mind talking about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, my brother got bitten by a mosquito. He got malaria at, when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, How old was he? He was three years older, okay. so he must be 16. Young, okay. Yeah, he was about to come to Canada. He was actually going to go to University of Toronto to study. Mm -hmm. So it was in that moment I sort of decided secretly, silently within myself that no matter what happens, I'm going to move to Canada. I want to take my twin brother with me and we're going to make his dream come true. Um, he was such an intelligent person. He was truly the gem of the family, probably a son that everyone wants. And uh, it was very unfortunate when he passed away. Um, was it like a long, did he have a long battle with it? I'm, I'm sure some people might hear this and not realize this could even happen. Yeah. Was this a common issue in Nigeria? It is common for a lot of people to get malaria, but not cerebral malaria. And that's what he had. Mm. And he passed away within a week. Wow. His organs started failing and there was just nothing anyone could have done. Hmm. And again, given that we were in Nigeria where we know that medical facilities, they're just not very good. Got it. Um, so if you had been in India, maybe. Maybe. Could, okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's also one thing that I do have to mention is the doctor that he was taken to initially um, misdiagnosed him and gave him prescribed him the wrong medication. Mm. And this is not the first time it has happened. It, this has happened several times to several other patients that mm -hmm. ended up losing their children to mm. the same doctor who prescribed the wrong really, medication. Really, to the same doctor? The same doctor, yeah. Really, really? Yeah. Interesting. I don't even know if I should tell this story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. My youngest, uh, who's a boy, we wanted to get him circumcised. Mm -hmm. And a doctor was, you know, referred to us. And the night before we were supposed to go in for the circumcision, I happened to look up the name of that doctor. Yeah. And a few years prior, he was accused of causing a baby to bleed to death by performing the circumcision on him. Not quite the same as your story, <laughs> but I felt like telling it. Yeah. We canceled the circumcision with okay. that doctor. Yeah. So, but for some reason, that's the first thing that crossed my mind when you said that. Yeah, so. that's a good thing. We didn't know, and if we did, we would have never taken him there. My right, parents. right. Yeah. So your brother wanted to come to Toronto. Why did he want to come to Toronto? He just, I don't know what to say, James. I think he was forward-thinking. He wanted, he had a different vision of life, of what he wanted to create for himself, and I think for us, us being his siblings. You know, I did mention that my, my dad comes from a village. His His thought process is very different to say the least. And the way we grew up was in a very different environment, very limited beliefs, thought processes. And I think my brother, because he used to read so many books growing up, he had a different understanding of what life could be. Mm. And I personally believe that his passion and his, his will to come to Toronto was doing after doing a lot of research and learning about the culture here and wanting to bring his siblings here. Got it, got yeah. it. Interesting. So it's, it's interesting that he chose Canada over the U.S. Yeah. Because sometimes you hear about other societies, they hear about the American dream yeah. kind of thing. So that's interesting. And so you decided you wanted to come to Canada. Yeah. At what age? Like 17, 18? Actually, it was in the moment that he passed away. It was <laughs> that day when he passed away. I remember the whole scene when I came home. Um, everyone was crying around me. My twin brother just broke down and started crying. And I think I was the only one in that moment who looked around the room and said, someone needs to be okay. <laughs> and I think it was in that moment I decided that I'm going to do everything in my power to not be the notorious kid of the house. Um, 
and try to focus more on education, school. Mm -hmm. Because before that, I was literally a kid that was all over the place playing all sorts of sports. You? Yes, I was highly engaged in everything and anything that the school offered. Whether I knew how to do it or not, I was in it. Um, you know, all sorts of sports, track and field, soccer, basketball, anything and everything, I was in it. So anything but your studies, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think it was in that moment when he passed away, I realized that I just want to make my parents proud. It was as simple as that. I felt very sad for them because mm -hmm. they're such kind people. You know, like mm -hmm. having witnessed financial struggles that they went through, they would still donate money. You know, even if my dad would make 10 rupees, he would donate two rupees, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was such a beautiful thing for me to witness as a young girl. And I felt really bad for them that this is what they're going through. And I started taking school a bit more seriously without having to share that with my friends because I still wanted to be the cool kid <laughs> in my school. So in the back of my notebook, I would write down every 30 minutes what I'm going to do right after school. Um, even if I'm going to study, I'd write down what I'm going to study and I'd scratch it out, rip out the page so no one can see it. So I was still the cool kid. <laughs> so you were the, you were the quiet uh, closet geek, sort I of. I think so. I think so. And people didn't know. <laughs> I should also point out here, not that I want to get off topic, during this, if I accidentally refer to her as Chili, yes. it's because when you worked in my office, you were affectionately referred to as Chili, you know, Anchel Chili. And uh, I told myself going into this, I'm going to try my best to call you Anchel. Yeah. But I'm so used to calling you Chili yeah. that if I happen to say that name, I don't want anybody watching this going, who the hell is Chili? That's okay. So, so I felt like bringing that up. So how did your brother Tushar feel when you told him that you wanted to come to Canada? He wasn't very happy about it because <laughs> his girlfriend at that time was about to move to India, Bombay. Okay. Um, I just, I didn't think that was the right move for us, for the both of us. I just, knowing... So you were going to follow him, if, if he went to India, you were going to follow him to India? I think the culture that I come from, it's not about what I wanted. It would have been what my parents wanted. Right. But thankfully, like, Fishar didn't end up getting into, like, one of the universities in, in Pune that we had applied to. Um, and I got into it, but he didn't. So woof to me. <laughs> but you know what the funny part is here, James, is when we applied for university here in Canada, mm -hmm. I did all his applications. Right. I got all his recommendation letters because I was so adamant on us moving here. I really thought if we moved here, it would change our life and we would be able to bring back a bit, di like a different culture back home, mm -hmm. you know, make mm -hmm. our parents see a different side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I fought for that. How'd your parents feel about it? They're very proud. Really? But at the time? They were very proud. <laughs> really? They're very proud to see that I was, that I had a vision, that I wanted to make that happen for us. Right. And the way I worked towards it, I was very relentless. So they weren't thinking, oh, great, my uh, my other two kids are going to go halfway across the world by themselves. They weren't, uh, they had, they were confident that this was the right thing for you to do. I think so. They didn't even come to drop us. <laughs> they just like, whoop, there just you go. go. <laughs> I think you got it. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, so you go to school in Toronto at, mm -hmm. at U of T, University of Toronto. Yeah. Uh, and your brother did too? Yeah. And what was your major? I studied digital enterprise management at University of Toronto, but I also did Sheridan College simultaneously for media and communications, just okay. because I thought both the programs went really well together. Yeah. And at some point, I was also working full time. That was not very easy to manage, but. You're working full time while you were going to school? Yes, while I was doing university and college. But really? I ended up, like, honestly, ripping out 4.0s after the other <laughs> during that one year. I was so busy that I was so worried that I wouldn't be able to, you know, do well in school. And my parents were paying international fees, tuition. So I was like, you know, I must make them proud. Um, so I would study anywhere and everywhere. If I'm on the bus, I'm reading a book. If I'm at work and I have five minutes free, I would read a book. And somehow I just did well. And when you graduated, is that when our paths crossed after that? Was, was your first job at, out of school working uh, at my company? I think it was a second second job. Okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, so you, you come to work for my company. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, you're universally loved. Everybody calls you Chili. Yes. And then uh, from there, I guess we should talk about Tushar. Mm -hmm. So I vividly remember hearing about this. I vividly remember seeing you. Can you tell me what happened to him and uh, 
how you found out and all of that? Absolutely. On July 12th um, is when my twin brother passed away. He passed away from a unit that we, him and I, we purchased together mm -hmm. in Mississauga. After we graduated, we got our jobs. It's going well. And I, I kept getting phone calls from an unknown number, and I usually don't pick up unknown numbers. And I didn't pick up the call. And at 1.30 in the morning, I had work the next day. <laughs> at 1.30 in the morning, I kept getting calls from my concierge. And I was living at Young and Eglinton, very close to work at that time. And somehow, James, I actually, I knew it in that moment when I kept getting those calls because I did pick up the call from my concierge the third time and it was a police mm. officer and I let him in. He came up to my door and he said, may I come in? Could you please have a seat? And even before I let him into my house, I actually said it out loud. My twin brother passed away, didn't he? And um, it was in that moment like when he said, yes, he did. And it, it looks like it could have been a suicide case. Mm -hmm. um, I just paused. I just took some time to gather my thoughts. And truthfully, I think there was a choice I had in that moment. Either I could have freaked out or I could have kept my calm, taken a few minutes, a few seconds to get my thoughts together and reacted. And given that I didn't have any family here, mm -hmm. I had to be the one to take that on. I wanted to take that on. I didn't want my parents to go through that. And so I did. I told the police officer, give me 10 minutes. I gathered my thoughts and I started taking out sticky notes and started writing out everything that the police officer is telling me that I need to do next. Like, um, like you know, I have to see him. Mm -hmm. um, I had to get a funeral organized and there's just so many different things that you have to do after that I had no idea about, you know, he didn't have a will. So I had to become the estate trustee. I had to secure a document and I didn't know what to do. I remember something about a cat. I, yeah, he had a cat. And you and you sent it home to your parents, didn't you? No, my parents were still in Nigeria at that time. Yeah, I, right? thought, I thought they wanted you to bring the cat to Nigeria, I thought. We were going to do that, but we didn't end oh, up you doing didn't. that. Okay. Yeah, I adopted the, the cat. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, I did. The okay. cat's still with me. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, um, but I actually had to call my parents on FaceTime to tell them. You did? I did. So I took 10 minutes. The police officer came back in, wrote down everything I needed to do, and... Um, Believe it or not, I actually thought about you in that moment, too. I'm like, but I need to go to work tomorrow. I'm like, what do I do? So I think I sent you a text message. Yeah, you did. I did, just letting you know that my brother passed away and I, I have to take care of stuff. I, I just need a few, few days. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was next, what was supposed to be done. But I did call my parents on FaceTime. I told them, you need to have a seat. We need to talk. Bashar passed wow. away. Wow. And they thought that the first thing my, my dad said, he had an accident, didn't he? Accident being, you know, driving a car mm. accident. And I said, no, he took his life. And they asked me how. And I said that they jumped. He jumped from the balcony. Mm -hmm. I remember at the time, you, th you had heard that he might have had terminal cancer at the time? Some sort of um, illness. We, we don't know. Okay, you don't know. Okay. We, did, um, we did get the reports through a lawyer. Um, but there's nothing in there. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Nothing in there. Okay. And I remember something else uh, right after this. And obviously you were dealing with a lot at once. And I remember you coming into my office really upset because you lost your phone on the subway. Yes, I do. You do you remember that? Yes, I do. And uh, I remember you were, you know, pictures and videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember I told you what the cloud was. I was yeah. like, Chili, put it on the cloud. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. So I remember that happening. Yeah. So uh, what ended up happening uh, in the aftermath? I remember uh, you wanted to bring Tushore back to Nigeria. Was that right? Um, no. Like no? This, we had the funeral here. We were able to get that organized, set up, the whole Indian ceremony. Okay. Learned about it. Things you learn over time, I swear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and eventually when I left Canada, you know, when – the whole work permit Oh, we're going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about it that. It didn't work out. I yeah. actually took the cremains back to India, met up with my oh, parents. Oh, you did? That's what I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. Met okay. up with my parents in um, in Delhi, went to the Ganges, because that's where we had released my older brother. Okay. 
So, okay, let's talk about the story. So even though, you know, this is not related to loss or, or tragedy, mm-hmm. I wanted to tell the story because it was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and because, to me, it was kind of, uh, kind of a, an element of grief to a different level, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was telling Nigel, who's producing this for me today, I told him about this off camera. Okay. And he remembered a little bit about it and couldn't believe it. So there was a little government story that I was involved in with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe it was in 2016. Uh, So basically, just to kind of set the stage here. So you come to Canada, you get your university education here. Yeah. You own a condo. I think you, did you have a renter eventually? I can't recall, but you you, you own a condo. You have a full-time job, you're paying your taxes. Mm -hmm. And what does the government uh, say to you? That I had to leave. They had to leave. Yeah, my work permit was just not working out. Um, we had applied to get an LMIA, um, and that was getting rejected because there was something called a NOC code, an NOC code that has to do something with the actual role, not really your title. And there was a big discrepancy there between what I was actually doing, like technical work that I was doing versus what was available on yes. the Governor of Canada's website. And uh, This is all coming back to me now. So, so basically... I got my employment lawyer involved yep. because I thought it was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at this time, uh, people, people if you're not in Canada, they may or may not have heard this, but at this time, there were a lot of refugees coming into Canada from Syria that were making the news because they were putting them up in hotels in Winnipeg. Uh, they didn't speak the language. A lot of them just weren't employable because of their situation. Meanwhile, like I said, you fully employed, pay your taxes, got your education, uh, you own a condo, and they're telling you to leave. And like you just said, their not codes were outdated. Yeah. So what the government wanted was for Anshul to explain, look at this list of jobs yeah. that they have and explain which one of these fit what you do. Yeah. Well, the not codes the government had were from the 30s, <laughs> might as well have been. And so online marketing, which is what we did, there was nothing remotely close yeah. on their list of not codes. Yeah. Uh, and that made it just very difficult in order to try to file this paperwork. Yeah, they have updated the list now. Oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah, but in 2015, not so much. Two th- yeah, right, right. Yeah. And I remember at the time you telling me, I think your, your parents, I don't think, were in Nigeria at that time. Yeah. They weren't, were they? I think they were. Okay, because I remember you saying something to me about, you're like, I don't know anybody in Nigeria. I remember you said, uh, maybe aside from your parents. I don't know. But it had been several years since you'd been back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you did have to go back. Yes. And so, obviously, you're here now in uh, in Canada. So, what happened? You went back and continued to file, I guess? No, that's actually not what happened. No? Uh, when I ended up leaving, I went to Delhi to take care of my brother's cremains. And then I went to Bombay for a little bit, attended a friend's wedding while I was applying for all the paperwork online. Um, I got an ITA for my permanent residency when I was in Delhi on January 3rd, and I left Canada on the 2nd of Jan. So by the time I landed in Delhi, I got an ITA saying I've, I'm now eligible to apply for my PR. Uh, unbelievable. It okay. was unbelievable. Uh-huh. But right away, I instantly got into like getting all my documents in order. It was a little difficult because most of my paperwork was here in Canada. Uh-huh. Um, but I was able to get everything, everything together, and less than a month, I applied for it. Um, I applied for my visitor's visa at the same time because I did a lot of research in the whole immigration system. I'm sure. To know that you can come back here as a visitor uh, on a visitor's visa and you can stay here for six months, Mm -hmm. but then you'll have to leave again. So in that moment, what I decided to do was I held a couple of um, nonprofit charity work in, in Bombay. That was the first time ever I actually by myself led a project. And while I was there at the orphanage, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to continue to do because this is actually bringing me some joy. And I'm capable of actually helping people, so why not? And I went to San Francisco after that. I stayed there for a month. I strategized a little bit, cleared my head, came back to Toronto on a visitor's visa. Um, A little difficult to coordinate passports because the government had to stamp it. Mm -hmm. Um, But the moment I moved to San Francisco, I ended up sending my passport to L.A. And using my Canadian driver's license, I traveled to L.A., picked up my passport from the embassy and then flew back to Toronto. Unbelievable. Um, But that too wasn't a visitor's visa. And eventually the PR got approved and then I had to do my landing. So I kept having to leave the country and come back in. And that was a scary feeling like it's a government like. Are they going to let me in? Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because you are 
such a threat to <laughs> to this country, apparently. I don't know why. I was gonna Things ask happen. you I was gonna ask you about your US connection because I remember you would go to Boston, I think, and you would go to LA and where did all that come from? I was just hosting a lot of events, James. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. I was just traveling around and about hosting events. Really wanted to help people understand that there's a difference in mental health versus mental illness. I think the, the because there's people don't understand that is why people aren't reaching out for help, right? Because we think that we can control everything and we can fix everything. But mm -hmm. you wouldn't say that if you had a broken arm. Mm. That would just be stupidity to sit at home and assume that your arm's going to fix itself, mm -hmm. right? Well, it will. It'll just crack a little bit when <laughs> you move it, but... And it'll take longer. <laughs> God knows how much longer, right? Yeah. And with mental illness, the longer you wait, the harder it takes to recover. Right. Now, that, that leads me to this next thing. So, Reach Out Together. Tell me about Reach Out Together. Like, where did this come from? Now, I got to tell you, too. So, after you left the company, every now and then, you know, I'd go for lunch with you or something, and... You're always doing something. Yes. You know what I mean? So I remember at one point I, I said to you, hey, do you want to come back and get your old job back yes. at one point? And you're like, I can't because I'm doing a public speaking engagement in wherever you were going. Yes. So tell me about Reach Out Together. What is it? How did it come about? What do you do? All of that. Um, before I get into that, I just want to say thank you, James. I think it's because of people like you, you know, because people like you, they, you inspire people like me to keep going. When I was going through a rough time back in the day, there was not many people that actually like supported me or guided me to the right resources that could have helped me. But you did that. And I think because of that, I personally was able to get a hang or a hold of my life. And I'm in a position today to be able to do the same for other people. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's ripple effect. You know, the kindness that you showed me is what I'm trying to go out there and show the world. Because sometimes that's all it takes is one person. And when I held my first event in Bombay for the very first time when I left here, it was in that moment I'm like, I want to do more of this. This brings me joy. And we came back. I came back to Toronto and just kept hosting events. It wasn't registered, the organization. I was just doing it as a community initiative mm -hmm. and I remember we sponsored one of your first events yes you did I remember that was a really big success as well okay. thank you for that that was really good we had about 200 people that came out to that young professionals we brought in a psychologist from CAMH to speak about mental health mental illness we had a lot of r activities uh, during that event that actually helped people talk about it whatever you're going through without having to feel judged you know, right. Safe space. So Reach Out Together essentially is about promoting mental health yes. awareness, basically. Yes. Okay. And we do that through hosting uh, community events, workshops, uh, workplace seminars. Right now, everything we've, we're have we doing is all online. Mm -hmm. um, and we, because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. we have had an insane outreach. People, the number of people that are reaching out to us from across the world. I'm sure right now, yeah. And so we're doing this in July of 2020, just in case anybody happens to see this on YouTube in a year. Yeah. You know, we're doing it in July of 2020. We're still waist deep in COVID-19. Yes. And so I imagine not only do you have to do everything online, but there's probably a lot of people looking for some kind of help because people have lost their jobs. People can't pay their rent. Yeah. So I can imagine. It's, it's, really, it's really scary a lot of times if you think, like when I sit down and I think about it, the people that reach out to us are people that are suicidal. You know, people, like you said, lost your jobs. People that that really have no support system. A lot of women that are at home in, in, in situations where, you know, domestic violence is, is happening and they're hiding and reaching out to us. Mm -hmm. They don't want their partners to see them. Mm -hmm. And um, they're stuck so at home, yeah. Yeah, because they're stuck at home. And yeah. recently we held our very first um, seminar for students in Indian language school in Nigeria. So there were 300 students that joined this webinar. And James, it was, it was, I, I can call it a successful webinar, but I don't know if that's success to hear what we heard. Mm -hmm. These students are not doing well. Mm -hmm. It didn't take them for 15 minutes to start opening up. Like that chat box would not stop. Mm -hmm. And they're young children mm -hmm. talking about suicide, talking about, I don't know why am I feeling this way. Mm -hmm. I have an amazing home, amazing parents. I don't know why I just feel like ending my life. You know, and it's just... It's been insane. So what we've had to do is we've opened up two free of cost programs for people globally across the world. 
Um, feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to know more about them. Um, one is an accountability program where we help you set a routine for yourself for 21 days every month where we help you work and to do one thing for yourself that will end end with you leaving feeling good and the second program is a resource outreach program where we actually have a team that does research on the back end depending on where people are reaching out to us um, they dig deeper and find resources physically and online and we send it to them and follow up with them every week because a lot of times pe people feel alone you mm -hmm. know when you're when you're struggling and you're not doing well you feel like no one really cares mm -hmm. no one's reaching out to you no one wants to talk to you so where we're just helping people not make them feel alone and supported. Right. Yeah, a lot of people, they, don't, they just don't know where to turn or they don't know how to open up and talk. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we're not really therapists or psychologists. We are the middle people that connect you to them. Right, right. Okay. Now, I understand you do an annual event on your birthday because that's also Tushar's birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the annual event because you were doing monthly events too. So what's the difference between the monthly events and the annual event? So the monthly event just we were doing that for one whole year um, in 2018 where we just wanted to see if people cared about it. Do people actually are, are they interested in learning about mental health versus mental illness? Um, there are five main topics that we cover in all our webinars, which is substance use disorder, uh, mood related disorder, anxiety related disorder, psychotic related disorder and trauma disorder. Um, and we talk about what they really are and what comes underneath them, right? Because a lot of times people are so confused. Like, for example, we use words like like bipolar disorder, right? There are two types of mood-related disorders, which is a depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. Anxiety is something which is very different, mm -hmm. but we help c create that clarity for people. And throughout that one year, there's just so much we learned. It was a lot of test, trial, failure, learning from it, you know, coming back with solid programs and not events. And that's what we learned from it, that events were great to host, to bring the community together. Um, but if you're looking for impact, we want people to keep coming back for help because that's really where you see progress, right? If there's someone you're talking to on a, on a recurring basis and you're keeping in touch with them um, and really like, inspiring them to keep reaching out for help, mm -hmm. right? Keep going for therapy if that's helping you, right? Just encourage that behavior if that's working. And that's really what we're doing now. So we've moved our focus from events to programs. Got it, got yeah. it. So you've got Reach Out Together. You're doing speaking engagements. Alicia, we're pre-COVID. Yes. And then it, it, as if that's not enough, you decide that you want to co-write uh, co a book. Yes. Which is the one that I held up here, Success Strategies. Now, I am not a book guy. I'm not going to lie. I did Didn't not... you write a book? I did. Yes. I can write. I don't read. That's, I, guess, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the difference. Yeah. But I did not know who Jack Canfield was. Uh, I understand your older brother read his book. Yes. What was all the book called them. again? The oh, chicken, there's multiple books. Okay. Chicken Soup of the Soul book series. They're, it's a book series for young children. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I remember when I was really young, I had a massive library. I wasn't a reader, neither was the Shah, but my older brother was. And yeah. we had a library full of his books. And I personally believe my brother was the way he was. He was so open minded and nothing like a person from my culture or the background, like where we come from. Mm -hmm. He was so inclusive inclusive of me, you know, being a, a girl from my community. He kind of opened the space for me to do everything and anything I wanted to, regardless of me being a girl or not. And I think he, you know, he developed that through these books. And I've always known of Jack Hanfield through him. And when I got an opportunity to co-author a book with him, I was like, Really? Me? Why me? Okay, so I got I gotta <laughs> sure. ask. Sure. I gotta ask. Yes. It's one thing to know who an author is, right? Yes. It's not like I know who Stephen King is. Right. I don't I don't think I'm just gonna pick up a phone and co write a book with Stephen King. <laughs> so how do you go from knowing who this person is to writing a book with this person? Like how does that happen? Universe just made it happen. I, I truly believe in one thing, setting a vision. I truly believe in it. It may sound weird to a lot of people, but it's real. Um, I had a goal in my mind that I just wanted to see him. I just wanted to see him. You know, when my older brother passed away from malaria, I was at home waiting for him. Never I would have imagined the guy's never going to come home. Mm -hmm. And I never got to say goodbye to him. Never. My twin brother was able to go to the hospital, but I was at home waiting for him. Mm. And I wanted to get closure. And for some reason, in my head, I thought if I saw him, I would get closure. 
because I knew how much he really liked those books. And um, randomly, I got targeted ads for Jack Canfield. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. And it was in his academy. The computer he... was listening, Chili. computer was know. listening. I know. <laughs> I know. Coming from the space, I knew it. But I actually clicked on it because it was an ad that said that it was he was looking for 50 students in one of his academies to train them um, on the success principles. And I'm like, why don't we apply? There's no harm. And I didn't think I had the qualifications for it. I was very young, but I applied for it. My application was quite solid, I guess. So I got a call, went through the whole interview process, and I got in. I was the youngest student that year, and uh, for the whole year, I was trained personally by Jack Hanfield, which was remarkable. I think the first time I saw him, I must have said something not very clever because I was just <laughs> really nervous to see him, and it was so. It was explain, amazing. explain the tr training. Like, what, what? Explain. What was this about? The success. What was that again? Success principles training. It's just to help people develop more of a successful mindset. You know, in in the face of struggling or when you're going through challenges, how to keep persevering, and that's really what it's about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. And so you take this course. And I guess he likes you enough, and boom, you're writing a book with him, basically. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I actually got nominated for an award as well through really? getting to know him in L.A. Um, it was the XB Award for Thought Leadership in Media and Communications. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up winning that last year in August, I believe, which was really cool because I ended up taking my parents to L.A. that, that oh, year that's as well. Nice. So they were there to witness it. It was really nice. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So we've talked before about the reason I'm creating Grappling with Grief. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about coping with tragedy, with grief, with loss. Not just terminal illness, but other kinds of, uh, of grief as well. Uh, and so we're going to tackle other forms of disease and illness, physical and mental, which is the reason why I'm talking to you. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, my, my father passed from cancer. My sister passed from cancer. But this is not just about uh, terminal illness. It's about mental illness as well. And so... I want to ask you, what are you ultimately looking to accomplish with Reach Out Together? Like, what is it that you're ultimately looking to do? What's your goal? My goal is to break the stigma. I really believe it's the stigma that prevents people from reaching out for help and support, at least people from my community and my culture. Like, there's this strong sense of masculine toxicity, I think, where men have to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I believe Tushar was unfortunately a prey of that. Um, the community around Tushar, we had no clue what mental health was. Mm -hmm. Mental health versus mental illness, that whatever he's feeling could actually, we can help him by taking him to the right help. And I think um, him not being in the right environment did not support his well being. And he felt so alone that he thought that that was the only way to end his suffering. Mm. And what I want to do is create an environment for people where there is an understanding of mental health and we're encouraging people in our communities to go reach out for help and support. Because James, we're not alone. Like everything that each one of us are going through, there are a lot of people in the world that are going through similar things. Sure. But if we can connect and talk about it, we'd be able to move forward, you know? I have been relentless in my pursuit of well-being the last, these last couple of years. It has not been easy. It may look like it's been easy because I'm like out there doing things, but it has not been easy. And um, what I have learned is when I wake up in the morning, I have a choice. Even if I'm waking up not feeling good and I'm demotivated, I don't want to end my day feeling like this. I want to end my day feeling good a good day, a productive day, whatever that means to me. And I'll do whatever I need to do to make that happen, even when I lack motivation. Right. And I want to help people have that kind of mindset because honestly, recovery is possible. And it's really not a big deal. Mm -hmm. If you're not feeling well, reach out for help and support. Mm -hmm. People want to help, right? It's like someone in my community who's not doing well. I'd be really upset if they don't reach out to me if they're mentally not doing well because this is the space I'm in. And if you're not reaching out to me, you're sort of taking away the joy from me of helping you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So reach out and don't feel like you're being a burden on people because you're really not. You're, you're giving them joy by reaching out to people who are in positions to help you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what therapists are there for. That's what clinical psychologists were trained to do. They're trained for this. And if they're not getting clients, 
you're taking away their bread and butter too. It's true. Yeah, that's true. I, I'll tell you from my, my personal experience. So when my father uh, got sick a couple of years ago, I'm not the kind of guy that is into therapy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that that's not helpful and, and for other people I'm sure it is, but not for me. It's just not something I felt comfortable with, yeah. uh, which is another reason why I'm talking to you because you're talking about if you feel like there's no one that you can talk to, there is someone you can talk to. Mm-hmm. What helped me was producing a documentary about my parents' lives mm-hmm. for some reason. Whatever it was, that helped me. It helped me to cope and it, and it helped with the healing process. Yeah. When my sister got sick and I started visiting home, I would actually bring a camera with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, as weird as this might sound to people, I would bring a camera with me and I would like record vlogs yeah. as things were going along because for some weird reason, I felt that helped. Yeah. Uh, because it's hard sometimes to talk to people because they can't relate, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I find friends feel awkward You know, especially when you lose a loved one, they'll be like, oh, sorry for your loss. They don't know what to say. Yeah. Right. And so you've kind of already addressed this. But in case anyone sees this who maybe they're in a dark place, maybe they lost a loved one, maybe they're battling uh, addiction, maybe they're battling depression, whatever. What is your message to these people, especially if maybe they don't have an outlet like I did or maybe it's just not something that feels right for them? What would be your message to them? Um, I'm going to say be relentless in your pursuit of well-being. Like life is so difficult. We will always have ups and downs. Um, But if you are able to find a way to get to feel joy yourself, then your community will feel joy too. When you're happy, your world's happy. When you're not happy, people around you are not happy. So find a way to find out what what works for you and what truly brings you joy. Uh, One thing I'm going to mention is I actually started a dance company (laughs) shortly after my twin brother passed away and James knows about it because dancing makes me feel so much joy. And instead of me having to go pay someone else to learn a choreography, I actually got a partner on board and we started running dance classes for the community for about two years. I remember the World Cup. uh, You had like a Nigerian dance. (laughs) Yes, we had a Nigerian dance too. I remember, I remember. Um, But honestly, we only did that because I knew that was going to help me feel better. Right. I knew that was going to get me a community to heal. That was your outlet. That was my outlet and I created that. And we shut that down after two years when I'm like, I need to focus more on this. Because suddenly you're just dancing every weekend, yeah. basically. Now I'm dancing every weekend, as, <laughs> and not as a company or anything. I just do it at my free time. I actually make sure to post it on TikTok <laughs> just because it keeps me accountable. Where I'm so busy myself, James. Like There's so much happening every single day. But if I can take time out for two hours in a week and just do one choreography, even if it's 15 seconds... It brings me so much happiness. Right. So I just keep myself accountable and I keep doing it every week. Right. And I think what you said about how there, there are, are people that can relate to what you're dealing with. Like you just said, you and I are not the only ones that have dealt with loss. Yeah. A lot of people have. And sometimes until they talk to others who have dealt with it, they do feel like they're alone. And so I, I do think that it's a good message to, to reach people. Don't be afraid to talk to people because people can relate. And sometimes it does help when you can talk to people about things like that. Absolutely. And I think we all have our own outlets. Like truthfully, For sure. I really think each of us know what we need. Mm-hmm. Like if we are to play a game right here, James, right now, okay? Like if I am to take 5% more responsibility for my life and well-being, I would. Like if we just take 5% more responsibility, you and I can come up with I'm sure five things that we can do in our routine to make ourselves feel good. Like, for example, when I say this, I mean... Okay, I'm not doing a Nigerian dance. No, 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 no. Not doing it. Of course not, but it could be (laughs) something else, like maybe continuing the video logs, right? If that's something that makes you feel good. If I'm to take 5% responsibility for my well-being, I would continue those those video logs. And I would say, if I'm to take 5% more responsibility for my well-being, I would dance more. And then if you go again, I'm sure you're going to be able to come up with things, right, that would help you. Um, But you can only imagine if each of us take 100% responsibility for our lives. I know that sounds a lot and it's overwhelming, but truthfully, that's what I did in that moment when there was a police officer at my door telling me my brother passed away to suicide. I actually took 100% responsibility for my life, myself, in that moment. Was it my fault? No, it wasn't my fault. But because I was in a place 
where I was in control because I took responsibility for the life that I'm about to create, I was able to get myself to do all the estate paperwork, you know, to go out there and apply for my visitor's visa and then travel and come back and all of that because I was in control, you know, because I wanted to recreate a better future for myself and my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, And also I feel like, you know, when I was really young and I lost my older brother, Prashant, to, to malaria, I used to, uh, along with writing things at the back of my book, I used to actually paint and draw. I used to, I locked my door. You mean um, like the Blue Jays, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the girls in our office when we went to a ball game, Ancho was painting logos on their faces. I remember. Yeah, Jocelyn was like, anyone here knows face painting? I'm like, I don't, but I don't mind trying it out. <laughs> and it turned out all right, which is so awesome. Um, but that's actually what I did. I didn't know how to draw. I just started drawing random cartoons. Mm-hmm. I absolutely loved Powerpuff Girls. So I... I think that's after my time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. But I actually loved it because, you know, there were three young girls that are saving the world. You know, it's all about that. <laughs> so I used to draw and paint them and eventually I started selling them. Really? Yeah. I eventually started selling them to people in my school. And I think that was my way of finding my therapy mm-hmm. through creative expression. And I don't think Tashar had that, my twin brother. He was, he found it an outlet to go out with his boys, to hang out with his boys, to indulge in substances with his boys. And mm-hmm. that did not help him recover. It may have helped him to forget in the moment, but it didn't help him recover from the loss and the trauma. Right. So right. I think each of us, we have the answers within us, like what is going to help us feel better? I think what we have to do is inspire ourselves from within to do it. Right. Well, you, uh, I think you're an amazing person. And, and you said earlier about how I inspired you. You inspired me in ways too. Because again, I knew your story. I knew about the things you dealt with from a young age. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you were able to channel it into positivity. You always have a smile on your face. Your, your, your laugh is infectious. Oh, thanks. Uh, and so I think it's amazing what you've done. Uh, and that's why you, I wanted you to be the first person I spoke to for this, and you are. Oh, thanks. And so I'm going to say again, this is Anshul Vash, founder of uh, Reach Out Together. ReachOutTogether.com is mm-hmm. where you can go to get information if you want to donate. That's where you do it. Yeah. You've got your book that you didn't sign to me, Success Strategies, co-written with Jack Canfield. Always a pleasure to see you. Likewise. And uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>